Uh, yes, I am heaven. Thank you for the restoration of the health, both uh, spiritual and physical. And uh, as we look into your word, may your blessings attend unto us in Jesus' name. Amen. And so uh, I'd like to welcome us uh, once again to this uh, program. We are uh, going through Minneapolis uh, 1888. And uh, uh, I pray that uh, our sessions have been a blessing to all of us. And this is uh, number 14 in this uh, presentation. This is number 14 in this presentation and uh, is um, entitled uh, How Did He Overcome? How Did He Overcome? And I pray that uh, it will be a blessing unto all of us. And so just uh, welcome and uh, the, the purpose of uh, having this series is so that uh, we may learn together. It is not per se meant for controversies, but uh, just uh, to look into the things which have been preached among us and uh, to know what is true, that we may be sanctified by it. How did he overcome? And so uh, I'd like to share something just uh, to share something. And uh, we are told that, uh, we are told that uh, it was a difficult task for the Prince of Life to carry out the plan which he had undertaken for the salvation of man in clothing his divinity with the humanity. He had received honor in the heavenly courts and was familiar with absolute power. It was as difficult for him to keep the level of humanity as for men to rise above the low level of their depraved natures and be partakers of uh, divine nature. Christ was put to the closest test, requiring the strength of all his faculties to resist the inclination when in danger to use his power to deliver himself from peril and triumph over the power of the princes of darkness. And so this point is so important that uh, he could have used his divine power, but um, uh, this was the closest test that uh, he could ever go through. And so Christ was put to the closest test requiring the strength of all his faculties to resist the inclination when in danger to use his power. They had agreed with the father that uh, he will not uh, use his own power to uh, uh, do anything for himself, to do anything for himself. And so it would have been, uh, of, it, it could have not been said it was a closest test if he was not able to use his power. And so I believe that Christ had all his power at disposal to use, but because they had agreed with the Father that he will not use it, but he will leave in heaven the authority. Leaving the authority in heaven to use it does not mean that he did not have his power, for we are told that the divine nature and the human nature were inseparably uh, um, one, and uh, the divine nature was not humanized, neither was the human nature deified. And so he had the powers, but he could not use it those power or the divine nature was not per se for anything else but for atoning for sin. And so Satan showed his knowledge of the weak points of the human heart and put forth his uttermost power to take advantage of the weakness of the humanity which Christ had done. So in order to overcome his temptation on one's account, we will be in April 1, 1875. No particular adaptation for obedience. We need not to place the obedience of Christ by itself as something for which he was particularly adapted. By his particular divine nature, uh, for he stood before God as man's representative and was tempted as man's substitute and surety. If Christ had a special power, which is not the privilege of man to have, 
And so we are talking about uh, in his humanity, Satan will have made capital of this matter. Um, the work of Christ was to take from the claims of Satan his control of man. He could do this only in the way that uh, he came, a man tempted as man, rendering the obedience of a man, MS 1, 1892. He the Christian may die, but the life of Christ is in him, and at the resurrection of the just, he will rise to newness of life. In him, Christ was life, and the life was the light of men. It is not physical life that is here specified, but immortality, the life which is exclusively the property of God. The one who was with God and uh, was, with, was God had this life. Physical life is something which... Uh, uh, individual receives it is not eternal or, or uh, immortal for god the life giver takes it again man has no control over his life but the life of christ was unborrowed no one um no one can take his this life from him i laid down of myself he said in him was life original and borrowed and undrive the life is not inherent in man he can possess it only through christ so look at this um, important words while bearing human nature he Christ was depended upon the omnipotent because we are looking at how did he overcome while he bearing human nature he Christ was depended upon the omnipotent for his life in his humanity he laid hold of the divinity of God not his divinity and this every member of the human family has the privilege of doing you see uh, when Christ was here he had the divine nature and he could break forth the inroads of death and uh, we are told pour forth vitality into uh, his body so that uh, it may not suffer and all that stuff. But when he was here, although divinity and humanity were inseparably one, each maintaining it is individuality and it is a specific uh, work, uh, we are told that as a human being, he laid hold of the divinity of God as in his human nature, show us an example of overcoming sin he laid hold of the divinity of god but by the paying of the penalty of uh, sin then he had to be uh, uh, fully god so that uh, uh, the character which is uh, fully divine could only be paid with a divine person who had uh, uh, the fullness of uh, god had bodily in this uh, we know that uh, his divinity was for not overcoming sin or proving that he was god but uh, for the sake of uh, uh, paying the price uh, of um, uh, sin, of uh, paying the price of sin. Just uh, something else so to think about is that uh, in, uh, I just want to put something on the board again. Just uh, below this, uh, I like to to put this uh, that um, if Christ had been deceived by Satan's temptation and had exercised miraculous power to relieve himself from the difficulty, he would have broken the contract made with his father to be a probation in behalf of the rest. So Christ never used his divinity when he was here, although he was a divine being and had divinity. He never used it. If he could have used it for any exercise in relieving himself, in doing any miraculous part to relieve himself from every difficult, any difficulty, he would have broken the contract made with his father to be a probationer uh, for us. And so his divinity was kept in check. And for what purpose? For the purpose of uh, making atonement for the purpose uh, of making atonement so uh, i like to 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 read this uh, uh, as we look at how he overcame about um, And I want us to look at that. We were looking at his uh, human nature, but I, I want us to look at uh, his uh, divinity when he was on earth and what was for his purpose before we dwell fully into uh, how did he overcome. So I've just told you that uh, in his humanity, 
he never used divinity. He was here as a, a, a human being in his humanity. He was of the same passion like us. He, 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 he was also affected with the laws of heredity. And so uh, let us not in his human nature give him anything that uh, humanity cannot have for overcoming sin. He was a real man. A human mind was his. A human body was his. And his, his humanity was created. But uh, also his humanity was not deified. So the divine, divine nature maintained its status. And what was it for? Uh, uh, what was it for before we enter fully into uh, how did he overcome? Now, in... Uh, MS 35, 1895, paragraph 15. Man has not been made a sin bearer, and he will never know the horror of uh, the curse of sin which the Savior bore. No sorrow can bear any comparison with the sorrow of him whom the wrath of God fell with overwhelming force. Human nature can endure but uh, a limited uh, amount of tested trial. The finite can only endure the finite measure, and human nature succumbs. So, uh, but the nature of Christ had a greater capacity for suffering, for in the for the human existed in the divine nature and created a capacity a capacity for suffering to endure what which that which resulted from the sins of the lost world. So it is his divine nature that paid for the penalty of sin, not his human nature. If his human nature is the one who, which paid the price, then it is a human sacrifice. Christ was crucified for our sins and was raised from the rent sepulcher for our justification and proclaims in his triumph, in, in triumph, I am the resurrection and the life, John 12, 11, 25. Jesus leaves us as our intercessor to plead before the Father. He has carried the sins of the world, whole world and has not made one mortal man a sin bearer for others. No man can bear the weight of his own sins. The crucified one bore them all, and every soul who believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So no human being, no single human being can uh, bear the sin of another human being. And so it is logical to believe that uh, Christ's divine nature uh, uh, paid for the penalty of sin. Now, to come so close, that, that was uh, letter 54, 84, paragraph 33. To bring this so close to how his divine nature is the one that paid for the penalty and not human nature. Christ could have done nothing during his earthly ministry in saving fallen man if the divine had not blended with the human. The limited capacity of man cannot define this wonderful mystery. And I'm not going to explain these mysteries of uh, uh, divinity and humanity. We just take as it reads that the divine nature paid for the penalty of sin. The human nature was for example to, for us to overcome sin. And uh, Christ never used in any single uh, instance his divine nature. Otherwise it could have gone against what they had agreed with the Father. The limited capacity of man cannot define it is wonderful, this wonderful mystery, the blending of the two natures. No one can really fathom the blending of the two natures, the divine and the human. Remember, I'm in letter 5, 1889, paragraph 6. It can never be explained. Man must wonder and be silent, and yet man is privileged to be a partake of the divine nature. In this way, he can, to some degree, enter into the mystery. This most wonderful exhibition of God's love was made on the cross of Calvary. Divinity took the nature of humanity, and for what purpose? So, why was divinity clothed with humanity? Remember, these are two uh, uh, natures inseparably one. Human nature for overcoming sin and uh, setting example for human beings, but the divinity for paying for the divine law that was broken so that uh, no human sacrifices was offered for the law of God. Only one equal with God, with the attributes of God, could be able to pay for the penalty. Divinity took the nature of humanity and for what purpose? That through the righteousness of Christ, humanity might partake of the divine nature. The, this union of divinity and humanity which was possible with Christ was incomprehensible to human mind and it will always remain incomprehensible. We can only appreciate what we understand. But although Christ's uh, divine glory was for a time 
uh, veiled and eclipsed by his assuming humanity, yet he did not cease to be God when he became man. So you see that when he incarnated, he did not cease to be God. He was God, but the divinity was veiled or eclipsed. When you talk, when we talk about uh, the eclipse of the moon and the sun, it doesn't mean that the sun or the moon is not there. It is just the other one is hiding the other, but the 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 the, the other one is already there. And uh, so we talk of of uh, the divinity of Christ going through an eclipse by humanity. The human did not take the place of the divine. You see that not the divine of the human. Each maintain it is indeed distinct individually this is a mystery of goldness the two expression human and divine were in christ closely and inseparably one and yet they had a distinct individuality and each individuality played its part i repeat humanity for showing an example and overcoming sin divinity for paying the penalty of sin though christ humbled himself to become man the godhead was still his own his deity could not be lost while he stood faithful and true to his loyalty. Surrounded with sorrow, suffering, and moral pollution, despised and rejected by the people to whom he had been entrusted the oracles of heaven, Jesus could yet speak of, um, of himself as the son of man in heaven. He was ready to take once more his divine glory when his work on earth was done. So he was not going to take up the divine nature when he got to heaven. He was going to take up the divine glory. That is what he left in heaven. But concerning the divine nature, in fact, we are told that Christ never left deity in heaven. He never left divine nature in heaven. He came with it, but he left the divine glory and he left the scepter to use this divinity when he was on earth, but laid whole in his human nature, the omnipotent of the Father to overcome sin. And then uh, he had to lay down his... Uh, a life at Calvary for uh, for the law that was broken. He was ready to take once more his divine glory when his work on earth was done. Why did Jesus possess divinity on earth or be the only one to pay for the penalty of sin? We are answered in um, March, in Bible Echo, March 15, 1893, paragraph 3. Jesus is our atoning sacrifice. We can make no atonement for ourselves, but by faith we cannot accept we can accept the atonement that has been made. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. No man of earth, no angel of heaven, could have paid the penalty of sin. For sin, Jesus was the only one who could save a rebellious man. In him, divinity and humanity are combined, and this was what made efficacy to the offering on Calvary's cross. If it were just humanity, it could have not been efficacious. But because he had divinity eclipsed by humanity or veiled by humanity, divinity gave the efficacy. Uh, uh, the, 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 the divinity gave the offering the efficacy that was needed for the divine law that was broken. So that is just uh, some some introductory notes and uh, I pray that these are not things to start uh, cavilling about. These are not things to start arguing about. It is as plain as I can get there. And uh, how did he overcome? Because this is the most important thing of all things. We can appreciate that a divine being paid for the penalty of sin. But uh, now going into these details that uh, how did he overcome is uh, really something of uh, importance to us. And so the aftermath uh, of uh, Minneapolis in uh, 1888, let us uh, look uh, into this. Uh, in uh, Science of the Times, October 14, 1897, we are told, many have no real faith in Christ. They say it was easy to, for Christ to obey the will of the Father, for he was divine. But God's word declares he was tempted in all points like as we are. And this is what I have been laboring, that he did not use divinity. Although he was divine, he did not use his divinity. Christ was tempted according to his elevation of mind, but he will not weaken or cripple his divine power by yielding to temptation. So if he yielded to temptation, then uh, uh, the Godhead was still his, while well, he stood faithful. If he could have yielded to any temptation, 
then he will have lost his godhead he will have lost his divinity he will have lost uh, his identity and uh, he, the wrath of the father could have fallen on him as it fell on adam in the garden of eden when did jesus use divine power and when he thus spoke and he cried with a loud voice uh, lazarus come forth with intense and painful interest or all wait for the taste of Christ's divinity. The evidence that is to substantiate his, his claim to be the son of God or to extinguish the hope of forever. And uh, we are told that uh, he is the resurrection and life and he could ask father of anything and the father could uh, uh, tell him to uh, allow him to, uh, 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 to, to have an access to his omnipotent, that is the omnipotent of the father. And so... Uh, we are told that uh, there is nothing that Christ did as a human nature that we cannot do. Even the resurrecting of the dead, we have seen human beings resurrecting the dead by the gift of healing uh, and uh, that vitality was poured forth from uh, Jesus Christ unto us. And while Christ was a human being, he used the omnipotence of his father to do the biddings of Satan, to be, do the biddings of uh, 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 helping humanity, and not um, uh, mess up uh, with the agreement he had with the Father so that Satan may not uh, have an accusation against him. The world so demon was equal with God, his authority was as authority of God. He declared that he had no existence separate from his Father, from the Father. The authority by which he spoke and wrote miracles was expressly his own, yet he assures that he and the Father are one. It has been denied uh, every now and then that Christ did not use uh, his divine power, but uh, the authority by which he spoke, he had told and wrote miracles was expressly his own. There is uh, a, a quote that says that all the miracles that Christ did for relieving the afflicted was done by the power of the angels. Uh, and uh, I don't dispute with that, but also I, I, I accept the statement that has been made in uh, uh, the Revian Herald that the authority by which he spoke and wrote miracles was expressly his own. And we have those manifestations of his father in him while he was on earth. The angels of God are ever passing from earth to heaven and from heaven to earth. The miracles of Christ for the afflicted and suffering were wrought by the power of God through the ministration of the angels. And it is through Christ by the ministration of his heavenly messengers that every blessing comes from God to us. In taking up himself, humanity, our Savior unites his interest with those of the fallen sons and daughters of Adam with, uh, with, through, with while through the, his divinity grasps the throne of God. And thus Christ is the medium of communication of men with God and of God with men. Now, the authority by which he spoke and wrote miracles was expressly his own. Christ could exercise the authority of speech and the angels could do his bidding. He was not here to show men what God can do, but he was to show men what man can do. And so there are times when the father allowed him to command the angels to do things. And because he is the resurrection and the life, he could exercise that authority of speech and then the words were combined with the divine power holding on the omnipotent of the Father to resurrect the sick, uh, to resurrect the, the, the dying. But Christ, I repeat, never used his divinity to relieve any pain or alleviate any temptation that he was to go through. Otherwise, Satan could say that a man cannot overcome sin. Throughout his life on earth, his power must be exercised for the good of suffering humanity alone. Bible Echo, November 15, 1892. Um, again, it was no part of uh, uh, his mission to exercise divine power for his own benefit. It was no part of his mission to exercise divine power for his own benefit. Notice that for his own but he exercised the authority and the speech and the divine power for the benefit of the suffering humanity. This he never did in his earthly life. His miracles were all for the good of others. It was no part of his mission to exercise divine power for his own benefit. This he never did in his earthly life. His miracles were all for the good of the others. 
again all the miracles done by the angels quote again we read uh, that uh, and this quote we have just read previously that the angels of God are over ever moving up and down from earth to heaven and from heaven to earth all the miracles of Christ performed for the afflicted and suffering were by the power of God through the ministration of angels Christ condescended to take humanity and thus unite his interest with the fallen sons and daughters of Adam here below while his divinity grasped the throne of God and thus Christ opens the communication of man with God and God with man all the blessings from God to man are through the ministration of holy angels. For is 2 SP 67.2. Again, uh, angels guarded him when he was on earth. And this is not something that uh, we need to say it was an advantage that Christ had because we are told that also the Lord will send his angels so that you shall not dash your feet. The angel of the Lord encompasses around them that uh, love the Lord. And so also when Christ was here on earth, he had angels, meaning that if Christ could uh, do things by his own, he, did, he, he never needed angels. Let us try to think about that. That uh, um, If uh, everything was at his disposal and he could do them by himself, then why need the angels? But because he was subjected to humanity his divinity kept in check for the purpose of only atonement but his human nature to show us the way to grasp the hand of the father then he needed an aid he needed the angels the same one who created angels when he came here on earth needed those angels just as we here on earth need angels and it was to show us that time heaven is at our disposal when we need it as even it was at disposal and uh, remember Jesus telling Nathaniel here from here from now henceforth we'll see the angels of God descending upon the Son of Man. And so we are told that he had angels on this earth uh, in his earthly life. Their unbelief bred malice. Satan controlled their minds and they cried out against the Savior with wrath and hatred. The assembly broke up and the wicked people laid hands upon Jesus, thrusting him from the synagogue and out of their city and would have killed him if they had been able to do so. All seemed eager for his destruction. They hurried him to the brow of a steep precipice, intending to cast him headlong from it. Shouts and uh, maledic mel maledictions filled the air. Some were casting stones and dart at him, but suddenly he disappeared out of their midst. They knew not how or when. Angels of God attended Jesus in the midst of that infuriated mob, and uh, preserved his life. The heavenly messengers were by his side in the synagogue while he was speaking, and they accompanied him when pressed and urged on by the unbelieving, infuriated Jews. These angels blinded the eyes of that maddened throng and conducted Jesus to a place of safety. And we are told that uh, angels are amongst us also to work for the saving, in, in, for, for, for us. In Gethsemane, Signs of the Time, April 10, 1893, paragraph 5. The Garden of Eden, with its foul blot of disobedience, should be carefully compared with the Garden of Gethsemane, um, where the world's redeemer suffered superhuman agony when the sins of the whole world were rolled upon him. Listen to the prayer of the only begotten Son of God. O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And uh, the second time he prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And the third time he prayed, saying the same words, O, oh, it was here the mysterious cup trembled in the hands of the Son of God. Shall he wipe the bloody sweat from his agonized countenance and let man go? The wail, the wail, wretchedness and ruin of a lost world roll up before him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling to the ground. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And remember also the angels uh, strengthen Elijah. The angels have been promised to strengthen the saints uh, 
and we find that they minister to John the Baptist and they will minister unto us. And so in the of ages 6, 94.5, no traces of his uh, recent agony were visible as Jesus stepped forth to meet his betrayer. Standing in ab advance of his disciples, he said, Whom seek ye? They answered Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. As this word was spoken, the angel who had lately ministered to Jesus moved between him and the mob. A divine light illuminated the Savior's face, and a dove-like form overshadowed him. In the presence of his divine glory, the murderer's throne could not stand for a moment. They staggered back. Priests, elders, soldiers, and even Judas fell as dead men to the ground. The angel withdrew and the light faded away. Jesus had opportunity to escape, but he remained calm and self-possessed. As one glorified, he stood in the midst of that hardened barn, now prostrate and helpless at his feet. The disciples looked on, silent with wonder and awe. Uh, How was Jesus to use his divine power? Again and again, he, Jesus, would have been killed and it not been, and would have been killed had it not been for the heavenly angels who attended him and guided his life until the time when the case of the Jews as a nation should be decided. So how was Jesus to use his divine power? He could not use it, and he could only use his divine power when the time came when the Jewish as a nation uh, case should be uh, decided and uh, uh, there was no other time apart from the time he went on Calvary and that is for the uh, uh, when he went on the Calvary and paid the penalty of sin then he resurrected and after that we are told that he could use his divine power when he resurrects goes to heaven and comes back, he says that all power and authority has been given unto me. Not until then, Christ was not allowed to exercise any of uh, his um, divine powers. Look here in the Desire of Ages 119. Christ was not to exercise divine power for his own benefit. He had come to bear trial as we must do, living as an example of faith and submission so uh these are the things we find in omnipotence we find what we call uh uh omnipotence the power to do all and um, the omniscient the power to know all to exercise the knowledge and uh, omnipresent the power to be uh whatever you want to be at every time, and we are told that uh, he was cumbered with humanity when he was here. And uh, the revelation of the knowledge, he was only to reveal that which the Father allowed him to reveal. And he was only to exercise the power that only God could allow him to exercise. These were uh, eclipsed by humanity. These are things that were checked by the power of uh, humanity and could not be used uh, uh, for the sake of uh, the contract they had entered in with the Father. The Reserve of Ages, page 49 says, yet, in the, yet into the world where a certain claim dominion God permitted his son to come as a helpless babe, that is what he was subject to the weakness of humanity. He permitted him to meet life's peril in common with every human soul to fight the battle as every child of human must fight it at the risk of failure and eternal loss. Jesus was not to exercise anything that humanity cannot exercise. He, Jesus, was not. And even though that uh, he could have given up, um, uh, he, he could have given up uh, uh, the mission when he was here, but for the sake uh, by exercising uh, his powers, when he was here, he never exercised them. But if he could even also have exercised them, then uh, he could have been lost because that would be against uh, what uh, him and the father had uh, agreed upon. And so uh, we see that um, as a human being, 
he never exercised anything that uh, we do not have at uh, our disposal. And so um, his divinity inactive himself and active for humanity. His um, divinity was uh, inactive for himself but then active for humanity. He could not uh, use any of his powers to do anything for himself. Again, uh, let us, in, in uh, it is the capacity, what is the omniscient? It is the capacity to know everything that is there to know, having complete or unlimited knowledge, awareness, or understanding, perceiving all things. In Luke chapter 2, verse 52, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Now, you cannot increase in something that you fully possess. And so you are finding that in his human nature, these things were not activated in them. Otherwise, he could not be increasing when already he has in human nature, he can tap into them. The child Jesus did not receive instruction in the synagogues, uh, synagogue schools. His mother was his first human teacher. From her lips and from the scrolls of the prophets, he learned of heavenly things. The very words which he himself had spoken to Moses for Israel, he was now taught at his mother's knee. In his human nature, Jesus Christ had to learn everything. He did not have this omniscient knowledge. He had to live like a baby and grow up as a, a baby. He learned a trade and, his, and uh, his own hands worked the carpenter's shop with Joseph. In the simple garb of common uh, labor, he walked the streets, uh, he walked the streets, uh, sorry, of the little town going to and returning from his humble work. He did not employ his divine power to lessen his burdens or to lighten his street. Remember, this is number 14 in the series, Minneapolis, 1888. How did he overcome? Who in the days of his flesh, when he had suffered up prayers, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears, unto him that was able to save him from the dead and was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedient by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So he did not employ his divine power according to deserve age 72.3. In his humanity, he remained human. Omnipotent, all-powerful, John 5, 19, 20, and 30. In becoming man's substitute and conquering where man had been vanquished, Christ was not to manifest his divine power to relieve his own suffering. For fallen man could work no miracles in order to save himself from pain, and Christ and his representatives was to bear his trials as a man, leaving an example of perfect faith and trust in his heavenly Father. Who is P92.4? So no omnipotence in his human nature. Remember, the two nature, divine and human, were inseparably one, but each maintained its individuality and in different aspects. The human nature was not deified, and the divine nature was not humanized. Each maintained its distinct personality. And so the issue is, how did he overcome? Did Christ have any powers that we do not have? 15 MR 25.3, the eternal Son of God, just as mighty, just as infinitely gifted with all the resources of power, and he was found in a fashion as a man. Although he had all power as the eternal Son of God, but when he was fashioned as a man, that nature, that divine nature maintained its place, and the human uh, nature had its own uh, place. If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread, but, but by such an act as this Christ will have broken his promise that he will never exercise his divine power in order to escape any difficulty or suffering that man in his humanity must meet. So we are finding that the temptation of uh, Satan to Jesus Christ was directed at his divine nature, not at his human, human nature. 
they were directed at his divine nature because that is where Satan wanted if he could be tainted in his divinity then he was not fit to pay the penalty for the divine law and so if thou be the son of God command the stone that it will be made bread um, such an act of creative power urges the tempter will be conclusive evidence of divinity. It will bring the controversy to an end. And he knew that in a moment, by the flashing forth of his divine power, he could lay his cruel tormentors in the dust. This made the trial the harder to bear. Why is it harder? Because he cannot exercise this. He has to remain as a human being, overcome as a human being, and then he can come and... Uh, be able to be a surety for men. Christ was put to the closest test, requiring the strength of all his faculties to resist the inclination when in danger, to use his power to deliver himself from peril and triumph over the power of the Prince of Darkness. Why would he be tempted to use it if he did not have it? You cannot be tempted to use something that you do not have. That is just a point I want us to make. The Herald, April 1, 1875, paragraph 2. It was difficult for him to keep the level of humanity as it is for men to rise above the law level of their depraved natures and be partakers of the divine nature. Again, omnipresent, the Holy Spirit is Christ representative by divested of the personality of humanity and independent thereof. Cumbered with humanity, Christ could not be in every place personally. Desire of AJ 669.2. So in his humanity, he could not be any in every place because uh, this is the issue and uh, we can enter into more details about what is omnipresence actually uh, uh, and you can read the book by James White called Pagio and uh, uh, just know what is uh, uh, omnipresent and we are told that um, he was cumbered with humanity so he could not be here it was expedient that he go away so that he may send his uh, representative uh, and so and when the devil had ended all the temptation he departed from him for a season or an opportune time or next opportunity came when the next opportunity came this day with God page 263 Christ never murmured never uttered discontent displeasure or res resentment he was never disheartened discouraged ruffled or fretted he was patient calm and self-possessed and under the most exciting and trying uh, circumstances. So certain ways until an opportune time came and this is the time, the time for crucifixion. In the context between Christ and Satan during the Savior's earthly ministry, the character of the great deceiver was unmasked. Nothing could so effectually have uprooted Satan from the affections of the heavenly angels and the whole loyal universe as did his cruel warfare upon the world's redeemer. The daring blasphemy of his demand that Christ should pay him homage, his presumptuous boldness in bearing him to the mountain summit and the pinnacle of the temple, the malicious intent betrayed in urging him to cast himself down from the dizzy height, the unsleeping malice that handed him from place to place, inspiring the hearts of priests and people to reject his love at the last to cry, Crucify him, crucify him. All this excited the amazement and indignation of uh, the universe. It was certain that prompted the worst rejection of Christ. The prince of evil exerted all his power and uh, cunning to destroy Jesus. For he saw that the Savior's mercy and love, his compassion and pitying tenderness were representing to the world the character of God. Satan contested every claim put forth by the Son of God and employed men as his agents to fill the Savior's life with suffering and sorrow. The sophistry and falsehood by which he had sought to hinder the work of Jesus, the hatred manifested through the children of disobedience, his cruel accusation against him whose life was one of, the, one of uh, an example goodness, all sprang from deep-seated revenge, the pent up fires of envy and malice, hatred and revenge burst forth on Calvary against the Son of God while all heaven gazed upon the scene of silence. Um, the phrase crucify him. Look at this again in uh, uh, 
Acts of Apostle, page 84.3. Acts of Apostle, page uh, Acts of Apostle, this is uh, page um, 84.3, we are told, and um, I'll read. Yes, we are told that um, the same hatred that prompted the cry, crucify him, crucify him. The same hatred that led to the persecution of the disciples still works in the children of all dis disobedience. This conflict was opened upon the Son of God. He was afflicted, he was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows and, uh, and acquainted with grief. The majesty of heaven had to leave the scene of his labor again and again because of Satan's bruising his heel. And finally, Satan's malignity reacted, reached its uttermost power when Satan inspired and control the minds of wicked men to crucify him. And so it is believed that the first cry crucified him was uttered by Satan himself and others just uh, echoed uh, the same. And now another scene passed before him. He had been shown the work of Satan in leading the Jews to reject Christ while they professed to honor his father's law. He now saw the Christian world under similar deception in professing to accept Christ while they rejected God's law. He had heard from the priest and elders the frenzied cry, away with him, crucify him, crucify him. And now he heard from professedly Christian teachers the cry, away with the law. And uh, this is the key for me um, that... Uh, if you will see what man will do when he rejects the influence of the grace of God, look to that scene in the judgment hall when the infrated mob, headed by Jewish priests and elders, clamored for life of the Son of God. See the divine sufferer standing by the side of Barabbas and Pilate asking which he should release unto them. The host cry, and this is Satan's voice, swelled by the hundred of passion, Satan inspired voices is. Away with this man release unto us Barabbas, Luke 23, 18. And when Pilate asked what was to be done with Jesus, they cried, crucify him, crucify him. So there was this horse cry swelled by hundreds of passionate, sat, certain inspired voices. That just the way God will inspire you with the word and you speak it. That is how Satan inspired uh, these people with um, the word crucify him. They were just echoing, uh, they were just echoing what actually Satan was putting on their lips. They were just uh, echoing what uh, Satan had put uh, on their uh, lips. Continued on again. We read in uh, 3SP 142.3. Again, he asked the question, why? What evil hath he done? And again, they cried out, crucify him. Once more, Pilate expostulated with them against putting to death one against whom they could prove nothing. Again, to conciliate them, he proposed to chastise him and let him go. It was not enough that the Savior of the world Faint with weariness and covered with wounds must be subjected to the shameful humiliation of such a trial, but his sacred flesh must be bruised and mangled to gratify the satanic fury of the priest and rulers. Satan, with his hellish army, had gained possession of them. Men were imbued with satanic spirit at the time when they decided that they would have Barabbas, a thief and a murderer, in preference for or to the Son of God. The demoniac power triumphed over humanity. Legions of evil angels took and dark control of men, and in answer to Pilate's question as to whom he should release, as to whom he should release unto them, they shrieked, A way out, away with this man and release unto us Barabbas. When Pilate spoke again to them concerning Jesus, the host cry was raised, crucified him, crucified him. Through yielding to demoniac agencies, men 
were led to take their stand on the side of the greater apostate. And fallen one looked upon the scene with amazement, unable to comprehend the degradation that sin had brought. Legions of evil angels controlled the priests and rulers and gave voice to the suggestions of Satan in persuading and tempting the people by falsehood and bribes to reject the Son of God and to choose a robber and a murderer in his stead. In his stead. Look, they gave voice to the suggestions of Satan. They appealed to the very worst passions of the unregenerate heart and stirred up the worst elements of human nature by the most unjust accusation and representations. What a sin was this for God to look upon, for seraphim and cherubim to behold? The only begotten Son of God, the Majesty of Heaven, the King of Glory, was mocked, insulted, turned, rejected, and crucified by those whom he came to save, who had given themselves to the control of Satan. The Herald, Herald, April 14, 1896, paragraph 8, and uh, to close up, the host Christ was raised by men who were inspired by Satan. And so the act deceiver, this is in Bible Echo, November 15, 1892. The act deceiver hoped that under the force of despondency and extreme hunger, Christ would lose faith in his father. How did he overcome all these things at Calvary and Gethsemane? The act deceiver hoped that under the force of despondence and extreme hunger, Christ would lose his faith in his father, work a miracle on his own behalf, and take himself out of his father's hand. Look here, that um, at the cross, Satan did the last push that Christ may not hold on the hand of the father, but he may work a miracle on his own behalf. It is fruitless to really argue that Christ had no power when actually Satan was just knowledgeable that this is the power he was driving force at. And so he knew that if he could take that step of exercising a power on his own behalf, he could take himself out of his father's hands. And what does it mean to take himself out of his father's hand? He will not go back to the father. He will be destroyed like Adam. He, it, this will be disobedience. And so the, the, the fact that Christ had a divine nature possessing powers to do things that uh, 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 could have uh, put him out of his father's hand is something that should cause us tears that it was really the closest temptation that this Christ could ever have to have a power that you can use, but you cannot use it because you don't want to go against the will of your own father. And this is even to bolster the, 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 the truth that Christ was indeed the son of God. Christ was not another God. Christ was not another God on earth. If it were so, he could have said, to hell with the other two gods. I am a God, uh, by the way. Let me do my own things. And if the other two gods do not want me, I'll be on my own and do my own stuff. This is not the case. He knew he was the son of God and practicing or exercising any divine power will put him out of the hand of his father, who he was a real son, and he would be punished by his father. This was no another God on earth who could do anything he wanted. He was here a son of the Father, both in divinity and in humanity. And anything he would do that was against what his father had told him, whether in divinity or in humanity, could have put him out of his father's hand and he could have suffered loss because also he was a person under another being. Had he done this, that is, exercise power to relieve himself, the plan of salvation would have been broken. For it was contrary to its terms that Christ should work a miracle on in his own uh, behalf. The act deceiver uh, uh, thought that uh, he could uh, uh, make him do that. But uh, we are finding over and over again that... Uh, he could, he could not, and he did not, and for what reason? So that uh, uh, he would remain obedient and show every human being that uh, it was possible to depend on the Father 
and be victorious. I want to just echo this statement as I close up. Uh, just one more slide and uh, we wrap up. Um, so this is the point I want to bring forth. Let us have been coming into me affirming that Christ will not have had the same nature as man. For if he had, he would have fallen under similar temptation. If he did not have man's nature, he could not be our example. If he was not a partake of our nature, he could not have been tempted as man was. Again, uh, his temptation and victory tell us that humanity must copy the pattern. Man must become a partake of the divine nature. And in which way? By uh, uh, holding under the... How can we copy the pattern if we must live with a different nature than he had? It doesn't make sense at all that time. Uh, we have to copy a nature. We have to copy his example while actually we don't have a nature that uh, he had. This, 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 this will mean nothing to tell us that uh, we must copy his example. It, it, it will not help us anything. And so how did he overcome when he was here on earth? Although he had the divine nature and all the powers that could be used in that case, Christ showed us an example that even if we have power in ourselves to do something, if it will bring the honor, respect, and obedience to the Father, uh, if it will not bring honor and respect to the Father, we don't have to do something. And so Christ having all these powers, being the son of God, he cried to the father, he held the hand of his father to do everything when he was here. And we, as we are here, it doesn't matter if we are rich, if we have everything that we, we, we can uh, uh, be uh, successful with. If it's not for the glory of the father, those things, we do not have to use them. And so... Uh, his humanity was our humanity. We have we don't have two natures. We don't have divine nature as the begotten of God, inherent power in us. But also Christ does not have an advantage because he was begotten of the Father and he has such a powers. He kept them in check. His glory was they uh, left in heaven, and humanity veiled the divinity, and humanity showed us an example so that. Uh, it may remain perfect until the death at the cross where actually the divine nature could pay for the penalty. And then we can also enjoy all these privileges. If it is by the angels, we have the angels with us. If it is by the Father, we have the Father with us. And if it is Jesus Christ himself, he is our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. And so we don't have to be overcome by anything but we have always to depend on the Father and he will give us the victory we need. Otherwise, bless the Sabbath and uh, may the presence of God continually guide all of us. Heavenly Father, thank you for all the resources of heaven has been given unto us that uh, we may be able to overcome the evil one. And so thank you because... Uh, it will not satisfy the infinite one to give a lesser blessing than he will give to his son, his children, who are obedient to his will. And so thank you for just uh, loving us this much in Jesus' name. Amen.